Good morning, South Point Church. How are we today? Yeah, come on, I think we're better than that. How are you guys doing today? That's great. That's great. We've had some amazing things happen this morning. Um, you know, I just was sitting back there trying not to cry, but just watching Sherry Ann give her, her, her baptism testimony. I mean, just the, the courage in her um, was, is amazing, and it's amazingly inspiring. It's also inspiring that you guys are a church where she feels safe to do that. And we, we aspire to be a church where it's safe for you, no matter who you are, where you come from, or what you're dealing with, or what you're going through, this is a place where you can connect in community and you can connect in others. So um, just absolutely special. And then I just want to thank Smiley for putting together a bit of a video. We just wanted to show you guys some of the things that happened during our Be Rich campaign. And if you're new here, if you don't know about that, we took about three weeks and we just poured into, we raised money, uh, we served, we went out and, and wrote love letters for each other and for people and just did a lot of amazing things there. So it was fantastic. Next year is going to be even bigger. Uh, we raised over 40,000 rand. Why not go for a million rand next year, you know? <laughs> You guys are laughing, but it can happen. It really can. So speaking of, we are talking about generosity in this series that we're in called Overflow. And this is something that, that's really special to me because Casey and I live in the benefit of other people's generosity. You know, as missionaries, when we came over to South Africa, you know, we had donors that supported us. And, and so it was their generosity that allowed us to be here and do what it was that we were doing. And so we lived in that. And, and this is something that I want you guys to also be able to live in and claim for your life. And so overflow kind of stands for the overflowing generosity and blessing from God into you. And then that will overflow into other people, which overflows into other people. And then we're one big, amazing, happy city. But before we talk too much more about that, I want to start off by asking you guys a couple questions. So the question I would have for you, and it's a little bit heavy, but it's just serious is do you have enough peace, joy, and purpose and closeness to God? So in your life, do you feel like you've got enough peace? Are you at peace? Did you wake up this morning with peace in your life? Or have you grown kind of calloused so that you don't even try and think about the stresses in your life? So that, you know, if you're sitting there thinking, well, sure, I've got enough peace, but, but, but do you? Or have you just learned to block out some of the bad things that would maybe try and steal your peace? What's it like at work on a Monday morning? Do you have peace there? Are there relationships in your life that are causing conflict? Are you worried about your finances or not having enough to get through Christmas? For, for many of us, Christmas is amazing. But for a lot of people, Christmas is a time where peace is a struggle. Because we don't have the money to buy our kids gifts. Or we don't, we don't have the ability to really celebrate the way that we want to. But I want you to examine your life right now and think to yourself, am I satisfied with the level of peace that I walk in every single day? Now, I can be honest with you and tell you that for me, I'm not all the way satisfied. There are days where I wake up and moments where, where I'm, I'm not at peace and I want more peace in my life. Same with joy and purpose and, and this feeling of closeness to God. Do you need more joy in your life? Would you like to smile more? Would you like to be happy more? Would you like to feel fulfilled more? I can promise you that everyone we saw on the screen that went out and served somewhere, that went out and gave time or, or gave money to the Be Rich campaign was filled with, with this new and wonderful sense of joy. And then purpose. We all want purpose in our life. Do you know your purpose? Are you walking in your purpose? Or are you just meandering through life? Or are you bumping from one thing to another to another? You can't seem to get it right. You can't seem to figure it out. And then the, this last one I want you to examine, closeness to God. Do you even believe in God? I want you to know that if you don't believe in God, or you haven't accepted Jesus in your life, that's okay. It's okay for you to be here and for you to say that and feel that. There's no condemnation in that. So maybe you don't feel close to God at all because you don't even know who He is. You don't know who He is or what He means to have a relationship with Him. But if I could ask you to think about, well, if He was as wonderful as we say He is, and if He was as loving as He says He is, if that does uh, come out to be true, would you want to be closer to Him? And so if you think about your life and you think about all the gaps maybe that you have in your life, the gap that you wish was filled in peace, the gap that you wish was filled in joy and purpose, the gaps that you wish were filled with, with closeness to God. See, see we, 
We can almost ignore peace, joy, and purpose. We can survive that. But when we're far from God, even if we don't know God or we're not close to Him, that we fill with other things. We fill it with alcohol. We fill it with relationships. We fill it with, um, with spending money. We fill it with all kinds of unhealthy things to try and bring satisfaction or, or just to try and dull this feeling of, of empty or this feeling of want, this feeling of desire. So I do have good news for you. No matter where you are in this process, no matter how much peace, joy, purpose, and, and closeness to God you have or you don't have, if you don't have as much as you would like here, then the good news for you is that everything that you need is just on the other side of generosity. So if you think about generosity as like a, like a doorway, and when you walk through generosity as a doorway, you get everything that you need for peace, joy, purpose, and closeness to God. Now, this isn't maybe the only way to achieve and receive those things. God can do that in your life in a lot of different ways, through community or through corporate worship and prayer like we do here. But a, a big way that God does that in your life is through being generous, through generosity. And, and I'll say that in generosity, so what, what is generosity? Okay, I, I've, got, I've formed my own opinion about this. And I, I don't want to tell you this and you say, you know, well, this is, you know, the Bible says, Chris said it, so obviously it's true. That's kind of like saying, well, the internet has it on there, so obviously it's true. If Facebook says it, then yeah, it's definitely true. But, but my opinion, as I looked through the Bible, I thought, well, what if I try and simplify, kind of simplify these things? And so I, I've kind of, I want to present to you just an idea. It's, it's like a thought exercise. It's a way of thinking about some of the stuff that's in the Bible. And, it, and it's this. I believe that maybe God has designed two generous acts for us. So I don't want to say that this is fundamental, that the Bible says that there are only two generous acts that God designed for us. But if I could make it easy for us to grasp, I would say, okay, all of the generosity that you see in the Bible, all the good things, you know, people helping the Samaritan on the side of the road, or pe you know, all those things that Jesus talked about being generous when he fed the 5,000, uh, when they were hungry and they didn't have anything to eat, all those we'd say, okay, maybe those are acts that come out of the love from a heavenly father. So out of the love of Jesus come these very generous acts. But when I thought about, okay, that there seemed to stick out in my mind two things that God specifically designed for us, that, that are tied to generosity, that are designed for us, and that directly benefit us in a significant way. And they benefit us in a significant way because they connect our heart with His heart. And those two things that, that we're going to talk about today are salvation and the tithe. Yes, I said tithe. We're going to talk about tithe. We're going to talk about tithe. I'll give you an option. Either we talk about tithe, or everyone with kids has to go home and have the birds and bees talk. <laughs> Which one's worse? Probably, yeah, probably the birds and bees. So these two things, I believe, were, were God engineered these things for your good. I believe that he engineered them for, for our good. And, and it's in the Bible. And I'm going to show you what it, what it is in the Bible. I'm going to approach tithe uh, with you from kind of a different perspective than maybe you've ever thought about it. So no, this is not going to be a message about how you should tithe to the church because you need to tithe and you need to give 10%. That will be in there. But that's not the heart of this message. The heart of this message is that you're going to walk away with two opportunities today to walk through the door of generosity and be filled with peace and joy and purpose and a closeness to God. And so I want to show you a verse in Malachi. And Malachi is, a, is, a, is an Old Testament book. And Malachi is one of these prophets. And Malachi is a guy that intercedes with God and the people. So Malachi talks uh, to the people, to the Israelites, on the benefit, or, you know, from the benefit of God. And so Malachi is speaking here in this book. And he is going to, to give the definition for tithing. But the definition is probably different than what you think it is. See, and, and also just to say, yes, this is the Old Testament. There, I'll, I'll be upfront with you. There is nowhere in the New Testament that says you have to tithe. But 
In 2 Corinthians, I don't have the verse to put up for you, but in 2 Corinthians, Paul talks about all these good things that you do, all these works that you do, all these, this serving and this loving and this acting you know, as the church. And then, and then it kind of ends with, and also continue to do the things that you were doing. He's referring to the tithe. And then if you approach Jesus, you know, uh, Jesus he, here in Malachi is talking about giving 10%. Well, Jesus asked people to give everything. So we should be a lot happier with, with, with this than what Jesus was asking you guys to do or us to do or some people to do in the New Testament. So, so I just want to be completely transparent with you. But one thing that does transfer from the Old Testament to the New Testament is the heart of God. That doesn't change. The desire that God has for you to be filled with peace, joy, purpose, and a closeness to Him, it doesn't change. The players change, the situation changes, but the heart of God absolutely just does not change. And so when we pull the heart of God out of these verses, we can take that heart of God and we can just continue it through all of humanity and all of mankind until the end of, until the, end of the days. That heart of God never changes. So the heart that's in this verse for you will never change. And so let's get into it. Now, as I was studying this, I, I found, you know, I could do a whole sermon series on this. It wouldn't be fun for you guys, but it would be, uh, it's, it, there's some amazing things in there. And if you're curious, well, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to save it for, I'm going to save it for another sermon. So in, 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 in Malachi 3.10, it says this, it says, bring all the tithes, and then in parentheses, there's the tenth, into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. Now, before we go on. I just want to explain this to you. Tithe is the word for tenth. That's where that comes from. Tithe means the tenth. It's not a word that we apply the number to, but it's not like somebody was sitting around and there was a, a, a great council and a, a, a big board of elders with the original Jewish church said, okay, we've got this tithe thing. How much money do we want? Let's choose, let's choose a tenth. And that's not the way that it came about. Tithe means tenth. And when it talks about bringing them into the storehouse, what the storehouse was is this was a special place in the temple. So if you think about the uh, Old Testament or pre-Jesus, you have the Jewish temple. And in the Jewish temple, there were a lot of areas that were designated for different things. And in this temple, there were these people called the priests and, and the Levites. And the Levites were kind of in charge of taking care of the temple. They were sort of the priests of the temple. They, they lived in there. They did everything in there. And they interceded with people and God. So they were kind of the caretakers of the temple, which was considered God's house. And inside that, there was a storeroom. And that storeroom was designated so that when people brought a tenth of, of their livestock or their offering, or uh, they would oftentimes take a tenth of their finances and purchase an offering, and, then, uh, and it would be like an animal of some kind, and that would be stored in the storehouse, in the temple. The benefit of it being stored in the storehouse, in the temple, was that there would be food in my storehouse. My is capitalized because that is God. It is God's storehouse. So here we have a tenth being designated to the storehouse, which is in the temple. And inside that temple, there's food in the house. So now if we go on to the rest of the verse here, it says, it says this. God says something just amazing here. God says, and test me now in this. It's the only place in the Bible where God said to test him. The only thing that God said to test him on is giving your tenth. And the reason God said to test me on that is God's not saying, I dare you. God is saying, I will show you that I am faithful to you. I will show you that I'm faithful to my part in this. I'll show you that I'm faithful to my promises for you. I'll show you that. You can test me on that. Nothing will ever prove that I don't love you and I'm not for you. So that's the purpose of testing. It's so that we can be, it can be proven to us. God's love for us. And so he goes on to say, If, he says, test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out from you. I like that it says pour out. It's not sprinkling. 
You know, growing up, when we had baked potatoes and stuff, I would always like cheese on it, and my mom would sprinkle cheese. But as a kid, you just wanted to pour the bag of cheese on the potato and, and then just eat the cheese off the top of the potato and leave the potato. But that, so it, it's not sprinkling. It says, I will open up the windows of heaven and pour out for you so great a blessing until there is no more room to receive it. So let me explain the heart of God to you, okay? This is what doesn't change. This is what what lasts forever. See, God loved the people of Israel. God was for the people of Israel. And in order for God to be for the people of Israel, He wanted to take care of the people of Israel. So I'm walking you backwards through this to explain it to you. God wanted to care for His chosen people, just like we're chosen by God. God wanted to care for his chosen people. So God wanted to care for the priests that were caring for the chosen people. See, God wanted his chosen people to be in communion and in alignment with him. And in order to do that, he chose to take care of the priests in the temple that would help the people uh, be in alignment with God. And so therefore, God is providing in the storehouse... That sacrifice would go to take care of the people that were taking care of his chosen people. So the heart of God in that is that God loves you so much that he has designated a place, a storehouse, which we could call today this church. And he has designated this. And there are people in this church that God has set aside. And and when I say people, I don't just mean me. I, I mean you as well. There are people in this church that God has set aside to take care of the flock. See, the whole point in tithing is that when when you tithe, you're aligning your heart with the heart of God. The heart of God is that you are taken care of, that your relationship with Him is open and restored, that nothing can get in the way of your relationship with God. That's the heart of God. The heart of tithing is to keep an open relationship between you and God. God wants you. God wants relationship with you. God wants relationship with you. See, at the time, Abraham had been given this promise that Israel would be a great nation and that Israel would, would spread and, and, and be, uh, they would outnumber the stars in heaven. But in order for Israel to walk into the Abrahamic promise, of being this great nation that would outnumber the stars in in the skies, they had to be kept in line with God. They had to be kept in line with God. It's like God knew that I've got to keep these people close to me. And they've got to stay close to me. If they stay in my presence, they will get all the promises that I have made them. Test me in this. I'll give it to them. But I've got to make sure they stay in alignment with me. So you know what? I'm going to set up this system, this tithe. Where people come and they take care of the storehouse, they take care of the priests, and those priests then take care of the people. Now, the, the, the other benefit to tithing, and, and it talks about this in, in verse 8, which, which we don't have for you. It's a, that is a whole other message in and of itself, is, is this idea that, that everything that you have doesn't actually belong to you anyway. Everything that you have it belongs to God. See, there's nothing that you have, there are no possessions that you have that are not either provided for you by God or under the authority of God. Meaning you may have obtained it in some other way, but that TV you bought because you sell drugs on the side of the street, that's God's too. It doesn't matter how you got it, that's God's. His authority is over that. He'll take that TV away from you if he wants to, in a heartbeat. See, everything we have is God's. So when we tithe, we're holding, 100% of what we're holding is God's. And God is just asking that we give 10% of that back. And the purpose of giving 10% of that back is to preserve and take care of His relationship with you. That's it. God loves you. God wants a relationship with you. The tithe is for you. But why is the tithe so hard? If something is so for you and so for us... Then, then why is the tithe so hard? Well, because it's personal. Because it gets into your pockets. Because it, it's, it's hard because a lot of times you don't have the money to tithe. You think that you don't have the money to tithe. Or you actually literally don't. You're looking at, do I buy bread for my family or do I give, uh, do I give a tithe to the church? It's hard. 
Tithing is hard because it also requires that we surrender. It requires that we give up this, this idea, I need to hold on, I need to take care of my family. Yeah, there are some people out there that are, that are maybe selfish or, or they're struggling with kind of this, this sin of just envy or this, this idea of I want more, I want more, I need to have the nice car, I need to have these things. And, and they've extended themselves and they have payments on everything. And there are some of those people out there. But for a lot of us, tithing is hard just practically. It's, it's hard to look at the bank account and say, I, I can tithe. But what, what I want to shift your mindset of or your mindset too, is I want you to walk out of here and know how much God loves you and how much God is for you and how much God wants this tithe to be a tool that connects you with peace and joy and purpose and a closeness to Him. And so I want you to understand this truth here about generosity. With, when it comes to generosity, it's not about how much you have, but rather trusting God with what you have. Now, th- this can be really encouraging or it can be really upsetting. If you're a multimillionaire trusting God with 10%, that's really, really hard. If you have zero money at all, 10% of zero is zero. That's easy. It's like, oh, this is easy for me. Love this message. I don't have to give anything. I got nothing. Goose egg. You can't divide a goose egg in half and give it to, give it to God. See, God, God shows, Jesus shows all over the Bible that it's not about the, the amount of money. It's about the heart behind it. It's about recognizing that it's God's. It's about trusting God with what you have. I and mean, there's a, a, an amazing story in the Bible where there's a woman that's giving, you know, uh, uh, like that's tithing to the temple and she gives the equivalent of like two pennies, two one cent pennies. And Jesus celebrates that because she gave out of this heart, this heart that, that she wanted to give because of her relationship with God. And Jesus celebrated that, meaning. Her heart was aligned with the heart of God. And then there's other stories where people had lots of money. And, and the first thing Jesus said was, Hey, I can see in you that there's this, this desire for more. You're building up riches because you want to be rich. And so, hey, guess what? Align your heart with me and give it away. But they couldn't do that. It's not about how much you have or how little you have. It's about your heart. And the important thing about your heart is God wants your heart to align with His heart because His heart loves you and cares about you so much. This tithe is just a tool for God, His heart, to connect with your heart. Now, what, what's hard about this is we find ourselves thinking about this. Do it so, okay, I can wrap my head around God's heart. God's heart's for us. Our heart wants to connect with His. But, but we think these ideas of, okay, what's the minimum amount that still counts? Pastor Chris is saying 10%. The Bible has said, you know, tithe, which stands for a tenth. But, you know, really, like, I don't have a tenth. Surely it's good enough for me just to start, you know, somewhere or for me to just give, you know, maybe a little bit of that. Or, and we ask this question, what is the minimum amount that I can give? And it still counts. You know, let me ask you another question. What, is, what if God said to Jesus, Hey Jesus, what's the minimum amount of grace that you can give people and it still counts? See, we don't want minimum grace. We want full grace. We don't want minimum forgiveness. We want full and abundant forgiveness. We don't want minimum salvation. We want full and abundant salvation. See, I'm so thankful that God doesn't think this way about me. I don't want minimum love for me. I want full and abundant love for me. And so God's asking for us to give, not the minimum, not even to ask the question, what is the minimum, but for us to just give the tithe. Because, and I'll say this over and over again, because His heart wants your heart. And all you have to do is align your heart with His heart. So now let's talk about those three things that, that we talked about at the beginning. Peace, joy, and purpose, and closeness to God. And when you take a step towards generosity, the first thing that you're going to experience with that is overwhelming peace. It's going to be amazing. 
See, there's something that happens when you surrender. When you take a step towards generosity, it's hard to, it's hard to set up that, that, uh, that EFT. It's hard to set up that auto draft. It's hard to put the money in the offering box. It's hard to let go of it. But when you let go of it, when you do that, there is this peace that comes from it. Especially those of you that, that maybe you're in debt up to your eyeballs or you lost your business or you're struggling financially or you had that extra kid that wasn't supposed to happen but it happened and now you've got an oops and an accident. And you're already thinking about school fees for that child. And it's like, yeah, my word. I don't have peace at all. I would just challenge you, take a step towards generosity and find the peace that's there. Let me show you this in the Bible. Let me show you this amazing verse in Isaiah. Isaiah 26.3. It's a simple verse. But it says, you will keep him in perfect peace. Whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. So again, let me walk you through this backwards. Because you trust in God... Meaning you're aligning your heart with his heart. You trust in God. Your mind is stayed on him. Which means that when the world tries to knock you off and say, you don't have enough, you say, no, I do have enough. When the world tries to knock you off path and say, your 10% is insignificant, it doesn't matter, you say, no, God doesn't care about the amount, he cares about my heart. When the world comes in and all your tires blow and everything bad happens that could happen, you, you say, I'm not going to be knocked off my path. Because my mind is not focused on the money I give. My mind is focused on the love that God gives me and focused on aligning my heart with His heart because I want to receive the love that He has for me. Your mind is stayed on Him. And then what does God give you in return for that? Perfect peace. Has anyone in here ever experienced perfect peace? It's amazing. It's amazing. It's like, uh, it's like this incredibly freeing thing. And I'm telling you, if you've not experienced perfect peace, take a step through the door of generosity. Let God fill you with peace. Because what happens is when you're generous, you trust. You trust God. You surrender. You let go of your, your will, your hope, your desire. And a lot of times, you surrender your fear. And then God gives you out of that. He gives you perfect peace. If you want perfect peace... This message is for you. Generosity is for you. Why? Because God loves you. Why? Because God will do anything to have his heart connected with your heart. Now the next thing that I believe that God gives us when we're generous is purpose and joy. And these two are bundled together because I think that purpose leads to joy. See, it's so sad when you don't know what your purpose is. It's so sad maybe when you're living, when you're searching for a purpose and you're living through all these different wrong purposes. Your purpose is not to be loved by your boyfriend and girlfriend. Your purpose is not to look amazing. Your purpose is not to be attractive. Your purpose is not to be accepted. Your purpose is not to be the cool person or to be exceptional or to to be the, the best marketing agent in your company. That's not your purpose. Your purpose is to be loved by God. And then let that overflow into others. And with that comes an amazing joy. Let, let me show you an example of that in the Bible. So in, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, 1-4, through 4, we spoke about this last week. This is about a church called Macedonia. It's a super poor church. It's a church that Paul had originally started. They've got nothing. They've got no money. They've got nothing. And Paul's walking around raising money for the church in Jerusalem because the church in Jerusalem also has no money. You know, they've experienced their sort of mini persecution. It wasn't COVID back then. That's not the reason why they didn't have money. But they've got nothing. And so... In, in 2 Corinthians, Paul's talking about the church in Macedonia. And it says, We want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. So God's given them grace. In the midst of a very severe trial, so they're going through a tough time, they're overflowing, there's that overflow language, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. Overflowing joy in extreme poverty. That's trust, surrender, and letting God have something that they, that they can barely even hold on to. They've trusted God. They've surrendered. They've got perfect peace. And because they have perfect peace, they're able to well up in rich generosity. Now watch what happens. Paul talks about in verse 3, because this is crazy. I want you to understand it's not just a verse. This is Paul talking, and, and it would be an astonishing thing. It would be something that, Paul, that people wouldn't believe. 
They wouldn't be able to understand it. So Paul says, I want to make sure that you know that this is true. So he says, I testify. Paul says, me. I laid eyes on it. I saw it. I counted it. I testify to you that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. They gave. They were generous. Why were they generous? Because they trusted. They surrendered. They were filled with perfect peace. See, when you're filled with perfect peace, you can do all kinds of stuff. And you can do it with joy and with confidence. And so in verse 4, it says, They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And this is what they were doing. They were saying, we want to walk in this purpose. Our purpose is to support this church. Our purpose is to support with generosity. Our purpose is to pour out with overwhelming joy. We've trusted, we've surrendered, we've been filled with joy. We've been filled with perfect peace. And our purpose is to overflow that to other people. It didn't matter what they had or didn't have. It's not about an amount. It's about this, this joy, this purpose that was in their heart. And then in verse 5, I'm going to read out of the message translation. It says, this was totally spontaneous, entirely their own idea. Meaning they weren't influenced to do this by, by a person. And caught us completely off guard. So Paul is he's shocked that this has actually happened. And what explains it is, is that they had first given themselves unreservedly to God and to us. They surrendered. The other giving simply flowed. There's that overflowing language out of the purposes of God working in their lives. And see, I I want you to to meditate on this next statement that I'm going to put up on the screen for you. And And it's this, to experience so much of the purpose of God on your life that the byproduct is overflowing joy. What if... Overflowing joy didn't come from everything in your life working out for for the good. So that when you have the flat tires, so that when you get uh, retrenched, so that when you have the squabble in the family or in the marriage, you've still got this overflowing joy because it's a byproduct of you walking in your purpose. And you walking in your purpose is walking trusting, surrendered, and filled with perfect peace because God loves you. And so your purpose... It leads to opportunity, which produces abundant joy. That's what your purpose leads to. Do you want abundant joy? Do you want perfect peace in your life? If you do, then it's all about you aligning your heart with God's heart. God wants to take care of you. God wants to love you. The heart of God in Malachi doesn't stop. It continues on for us. And if you're feeling tension right now of, of like, well, I don't have to give. I don't have to tithe. I don't have to do this. You know what? That's fine. I don't want to convince you otherwise. I don't want to convince you that you have to do this. That's not my job. My job is to convey to you the truth that God loves you. And he set up these systems of generosity so that you can experience his love. You can experience perfect peace. You can experience abundant joy. You can experience walking in your purpose. Now the last thing that I believe we get when you walk through a door of generosity, and and this is what we're going to end on, is is you get a unique closeness to Him. I want to read this verse for you in 2 Corinthians 8-7. Paul is talking about this unique closeness to Him, and he says this, But since you excel in everything... So he's saying, you guys are amazing. In faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love that we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. Because Paul knows that if you excel in the grace of giving, then others are going to excel in peace and in joy and in purpose and in closeness to God. See, Paul is saying, as good as you are everywhere, also be good with your finances. This is, this, is, this is God talking here, not me, not South Point Church, not New Age culture. It's God. God's talking here in this. And so I, I just want to help you reframe your mindset. And it, it says generosity gives you an opportunity to prove that God is there and he's paying attention to you. Let me illustrate this to you. Um, years and years ago, when Casey and I first moved down to, uh, to Cape Town, we moved down from Nelspruit, and we were living over in, in Newlands, and 
I was having uh, just a really hard time and had been having a hard time for a couple years. And I was kept asking God, like, God, don't you hear me? Don't you see me? I'm struggling. I'm really struggling. God, don't you see me? Don't you hear me? Help me. And it just felt like nothing was coming. It felt like God was off doing a God thing with somebody else. And I was just stuck in this really low season, stuck in this huge amount of struggle. And one night, I just got in the bathtub so I could just put my head under the water. Sometimes I would just be on my knees in my office or somewhere just asking God, do you see me? Do you see me? Do you know that I'm hurting? Do you know that I'm here? And there was one night I just couldn't take it anymore. And actually we had, um, uh, 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 we didn't have a shower in our bedroom. We had a bathtub. And so I just ran a bath sitting in it. And then I just put my head underwater just because it was like a sensory deprivation tank. Just trying to quiet all the noise and stuff that I was thinking, including my thoughts. And so I'd put my head underwater, come up, put my head underwater, just trying to like quiet myself. And at one point I picked my head out of the water and Casey is standing there. And she says, hey, I just wanted to come in and tell you that somebody, uh, one of our donors just dropped $5,000 into our account. And I just was overwhelmed with this feeling. It wasn't about the money. I I mean, that's a lot of money. That's a huge gift, a huge blessing. But in that moment, I could have cared less if it was five grand, one grand, one dollar, ten dollars. It didn't matter. What mattered is in that moment, I felt like God was listening to me and that he heard me. I felt like he was paying attention to the hurt that I was going through. See, it was the generosity of our friends, of our donor. They walked in generosity, with joy, with perfect peace, in their purpose. And in their closeness to God, they heard God say, I want you to send this to the Ladd family. And that caught me at the perfect moment. In a low of all lows, in a dark bathroom, laying in a tub, ungloriously. Caught me pulling my head out of the water to take a breath. And God said, I see you. I see you and you matter to me. And so what we're going to do today is is we're going to...